February. Today we're in chapter 4 in the book of Galatians. We will be looking at verses 1 through 11, and I want to share with you concerning the fullness of time, and you'll see that as it develops in this passage. So let's begin reading here in Galatians chapter 4 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 11, and we'll get into our study. Paul writes, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. And therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God's. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Now, as we've been looking at the book of Galatians, remember with me what we looked at last time. Last time we were looking at verses uh, 26, we looked at verses 26 through 29, and, and I want to use that as a uh, foundation for our, our uh, chapter 4 study today. But in chapter 3, remember with me in verse 26 how he had said, You are sons of God, you are all sons of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. So I want to lay a foundation. First, I'd like to remind us that we become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I didn't become a child of God simply because I was involved in any religious rituals. I didn't become a child of God because of my upbringing. I didn't become a child of God, neither did you, by your, your own efforts. You didn't become a child of God in that way. You became a child of God because you have faith. You have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have faith in your faith. You have faith in God. You have a faith in God, and you've come to faith in God through what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. And when you embrace that, when you begin to understand that faith is not just some nebulous thing that we have, something that we deposit in something out there with the, with the hope that perhaps we've made a good decision in this. Faith is different than that. Faith is putting your entire rest and trust into, into Jesus Christ. It's, it's trusting him. One of the closest words that you can get in the English language as a synonym for faith would be trust. You have trusted him. You trust him. Not many of us know how to trust very much. We don't trust other people. We don't trust institutions. We don't trust many things, but that's how you got saved. You trusted God. You put your faith in God. You trusted God because God's word said that he sent his son. You trusted God because God said he loved you so much that his son died on a cross for you. You trusted God because God said that Jesus dying on that cross was buried, but on the third day he rose from the dead. And you trust that God is telling you the truth, that he can make you a new creation, that old things will be passed away that you can become the temple of the Spirit of God, that God himself will dwell within you. You trusted God when he said that's the truth. And that's how you got saved. When you heard that Jesus Christ loved you, died for you, paid the penalty for you, would even reside in you, well, you trusted him. It's like what John in 1 John chapter 4, verse 15 says, when he says, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. So this recognition, this putting your full weight of trust in the Lord has resulted in God residing in you. Those who are entering into the churches of Galatia are saying to them that the only way that they can have a potential for salvation is to come under the bondage of keeping rules and regulations, the law of Moses. Paul is arguing against that and he's saying that's not how you were saved. You were saved by faith in Christ and and that's how you became a son of God. In Romans, in chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, Paul said, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, Paul in his writings makes it very clear that salvation is through faith and not by the works of the law. Remember in chapter 3 how he had said at verse 6 and 7, he had said, Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And so we have been saved through faith, and that's how it works in the kingdom of God. Now, when Paul was writing a letter to the uh, church of Rome, it's found in in chapter 3, verses 21 through 28, this is what I'm going to share with you out of uh, a different translation. It's called the New Living Translation. But in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 28, this is what Paul writes concerning faith and being saved by faith. He says, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Well, can we boast then? that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. And so all through the New Testament, and especially as you see it revealed in the writings of Paul, we are saved through faith. And that's what he had said in chapter 3, verse 26, when he said, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. There's another thing I want to point out, and that is in verse 26 again. Notice how he says, you are all sons of God. When he says, you are all sons of God, that's really a revolutionary statement. He's saying both Jews and Gentiles become the children of God in the same way, through faith in Jesus Christ. And he's pointing out that Gentiles, non-Jews, can actually become a full heir of God, and that's a revolutionary thought. You see, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, it says, The Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. That is a revolutionary thought because the Gentiles didn't have a relationship with God. The Jews had the covenants and promises. They had the word of God, the prophets, the miracles, the signs. Through the Jewish nation, Messiah came. They had those advantages. But God made it clear that he was taking the Jew and he was taking the Gentile and he was making one new man and that would be the person who was a Christian, the one who was saved, the one who has a relationship with God. In the Old Testament, humanity is divided into two sections, Jew and Gentile. And throughout the Old Testament, you will see the Jew and the Gentile spoken of. In the New Testament, humanity is divided into three. You have Jew, you have Gentile, and you have the church. And the church is that one new man, whether Jewish or whether Gentile, and they are part of this new nation, if you will, because they committed themselves to God through Jesus Christ. Now, when he says you're all sons of God, you know, it's, an, it's important to point this out because, I don't know, I'm an old hippie and I used to think in certain ways. In my teen years and all, in the early in my early 20s, it was still pretty common for people to run around and call each other brother, you know, hey brother, you know. And it was this kind of general humanity that we all considered ourselves to be in some way related to the fact that we were all human beings. And so we'd call each other brother, and we even went so far as to say that we were all, you know, children of God. 
Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that prior to our coming to a knowledge of God, we're, we're actually, we actually do not know him. We have no relationship with him. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 even makes it very clear there when he says, Some will say to me in that day that I prophesied in your name, I did many works and wonders in your name. And Jesus said, they're just going to say, uh, Depart from me, I never knew you. We didn't have a relationship, even though you may think because you were religious and did things in my name that we somehow were connected. But Jesus makes it very clear. I, I never knew you. We never had a relationship. I never, never, ever knew you. We never knew each other at all. You thought that you knew me, but I never recognized you. We become children of God, not simply because we go through rituals, not simply because we believe that there is a God. The Bible teaches we become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ and we're born again. But as, to, as, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even unto those who believe in his name, John says in John 1, 12. And so that comes through a relationship with God. We become sons of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and as his children, we are now, because the Holy Spirit lives within us, we are now led by his spirit and, and led by his word. Romans 8, 14 and 15 says it like this, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The word Abba is a, is a diminutive. It, it means it's like the word Daddy. It speaks of when a child would speak to their father. And to this day in Israel, you'll hear a small child speaking to their father, and they say, Abba. It's another way of saying daddy. And he's saying you have a close relationship with God as a child with their father. And that came when you got saved. And now you have that, that personal knowledge of God. And, and, and by the way, as your father, his ear is always attuned to your voice. Even grandfathers are like that. You... Your ear is attuned to the voice of your child. I have staff meetings on Tuesday. And um, my granddaughter Sophie was with her mama in her office yesterday. And as I was seated there in my meeting with several of the men, I stopped and I heard, I could hear this voice. And and the guys know me. I mean, I get this inclination. I want to get up because she was crying. Because the baby was crying. And my very first thing is, I don't care if we're having a meeting. I'll see you in a moment. It's one of those things where I want to get up and I want to go into the other room and I want to pick up my granddaughter and I want to kiss her and I want to hold her and I want to slap her mom around for a while. <laughs> then, I want, then I want to kiss and hold my granddaughter. My ear is attuned to her cry, and, and I will hear her. I will hear it, even if the door is closed, and even if my door is closed, I will hear that cry. I can hear it. That's my baby. And if I'm that way as, as a human father and grandfather, how much more so is God that way on our behalf for us? He, you don't even have to make the cry out loud. You can have a groaning within your heart that is unutterable, but God hears it, and he knows your tears, and he knows your crying, he knows your hurt, he knows your voice. And that, to me, is a tremendous blessing, and that's why we can call him Daddy. That's why we can call him our Father. Now, as we've been looking at this, I want to remind you of a couple other things before we get into chapter 4. I want to remind you, he said in verse 27, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, in other words, when you trusted the Lord, uh, you are now in fellowship with him. You are brought into the body of Christ. You are clothed in Christ. And uh, that demonstrates your salvation. And, and in that, there is neither Jew and there's neither Greek. We're all one in Jesus Christ. We are Abraham's seed. We're heirs according to his promise. There are no distinctions any longer. Again, I was mentioning a moment ago that the Jews had advantages in that they had the word of God they had the promises of God, the covenants of God, the prophets of God, the miracles that God had performed. They had all of these advantages, and from them, Messiah came. It's interesting in the New Testament, when Paul speaks concerning the Gentiles, he makes it clear that they didn't know God. Uh, notice how he says it in chapter 4, verse 8. Uh, Indeed, when you did not know God. 
So the, the Gentiles are not spoken of as knowing God. They're spoken of as not knowing him. They're speaking of as those who did not know God. You see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 5. Uh, you see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, where, where Paul says that you were without God and without Christ in the world. And so before they got saved, before these Gentiles came into a relationship with God, they, they did not know him. But God revealed himself to them through the gospel. And now there's no longer Jew and there's no longer Gentile. There's simply that one new man. And that's the promise that they have in Christ and their heirs of the, of the uh, various blessings that God has for them. And so he continues into verse 1 in chapter 4 by saying it this way. He says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Now when he speaks of the heir, we need to remember that during the time of Christ, there was actually a prescribed time when the child would come of age. In the Jewish uh, faith, uh, until the age of 12, a Jewish boy was under the direct and he was under the absolute control of a father. But at his bar mitzvah, which was observed the first Sabbath after his 12th birthday, he would become a man. And, and the father would actually pray in that bar mitzvah ceremony. He would pray, Blessed be thou, O God, who has taken from me the responsibility of this boy. And the son would pray and say, O oh my God and God of my father, on this solemn and sacred day which marks my passage from boyhood to manhood, I humbly raise my eyes unto thee and declare with sincerity and truth that henceforth I will keep thy commandments and undertake to bear the responsibility of my actions towards thee. I will be responsible for my own life at the age of 12. Now, the Greeks were different. The boy was under his father's control until the age 18. And at that time, a festival would be held in which the boy was declared to be in training for two years, during which he would have special responsibilities to his clan or his city-state. At the age of 20, the boy's long hair was cut off and offered to the god Apollos, the god of prophecy, music, medicine, and poetry. And he would enter in to manhood. The Romans, well, at the Roman ceremony, boys would take their toys and offer them in sacrifice to the gods as a symbol of putting childhood behind them. That gives us insight into what Paul was speaking about in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when he said, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. I got rid of my toys. In our society, we get rid of our toys when we, when we die. I, think, you know, I don't think we ever do. There was a cutoff period where you actually transitioned. Under the law here in the United States, when you're 18, you're an adult. You can go out at the age of 17 years, 364 days, and do something and be charged as a minor that if you did the next day, you would be charged as an adult. One day difference. At 18, you're recognized as being an adult. And so there was actually transition period. And what Paul's speaking about here is he's speaking concerning the fact that, that sons had transition periods. And so when he says in verse 1 again, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, meaning that he was not yet looked at as being an adult, and therefore he was not fully under his own control. He says he's under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. He's referring to that. He's making it clear that he is still cared for by the guardians even if he stands to inherit everything. He doesn't receive it until he comes of age. And then at that date the Father um, changes, it changes everything and he now is in control of his own life. Even so, verse three, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, he says, even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements. The, that word element, that word element is an interesting Greek word. What it speaks of is the foundations or building blocks. It actually speaks of the, like the ABC, something that is in a line or lined up. 
And when he speaks about being in the bondage of the elements, the basic elements of the world system, it would be the basic assumptions of human religious systems. Before you experienced the grace of God, you were in bondage to the assumptions of religious systems that told you you have to do certain things to please God. Every religious system, to my knowledge, at least the ones that I've become familiar with over the years, has one thing in common, and that is it's all merit-driven. It's all, I have to do something in order to get something. That is part of our pagan heritage. That is part of our pagan mentality. And that if I'm going to get anything from God, it's only going to be if I give God something great, if I give to Him something that, that almost forces Him to give me something in return. And that's part of the system of sacrifice. And when you look into some of the stories in history and mythology of the Greeks, you'll see that, that a king is at war with another king. And he's attempting to get into his ships to cross over in order that he might land and, and take his, his, uh, his, his military force and overcome this enemy. But, but the problem is, is the, the waves of the sea are, and the wind is in opposition to him and, and he, he can't sail. And, and so what does he do? He takes his daughter and, and, and he puts her uh, on a pillar and, and he sacrifices her to the, to the gods in order that he might have fair sailing, in order that he might go out and, and, and win this, this battle and defeat this enemy. And you see that in history that they actually believed like that. So for them to satisfy the wrath of a god that was in opposition to them, they would actually have to do something great and give it something that meant everything to them. But in Christianity, we see something entirely different. We see a God who's entirely different. When you just think, just for a moment, how if we really had a, a system that was simply built on only the strong surviving and the weaker always being preyed on by the stronger, then if you had a concept at all of a God, it would make sense to me that if he's strong and he's God, he'd have to be stronger than all. Therefore, he preys on me. So how am I going to be able to satisfy a God who's actually out to get me and not help me? Well, I'm going to have to do something to satisfy his anger, and therefore I'll give him something that is costly to me, whether it's my child, whether it's all my wealth, what it may be, whatever it is, I'll give it to him and perhaps he'll be satisfied. Because if I'm going to follow the logic of the world and if I believe in an evolutionary system, then I'm going to have to believe that. I'm going to have to believe that if there's a God, he's the greatest of all. And because the smaller is always preyed upon by the greater, that means the God who is of this world in this universe, creator of all things, must be incredibly powerful. Therefore, he preys on human beings. I have to give him something to satisfy that. But wait a minute. The Bible says something entirely different. This God who is the creator of all things and is the most powerful being that, that is, did something for me. It wasn't a great thing that I did for him. It was a great thing that he did for me when he gave his son to die on the cross for me. That flies in the face of all logic, to be honest with you. But that's what the Bible teaches. Pagans have a system that is merit-driven. If I do things, perhaps he'll do something for me. God says, that's the elementary things you were in bondage to in the world. That is not God's way. That's deceptive philosophy that will hold you in bondage. It's like what he spoke in Colossians 2, verse 8, when he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. Colossians 2.20, he says, Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? He's saying, don't you understand the grace of God, that God sent his son Jesus so that you could be set free from this bondage? He says in verse 4, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. The fullness of time. That, that refers to a completion of the period of preparation in God's timetable. In other words, when the law fully completed its purpose, God sent his son. 
and Jesus Christ provided the righteousness for man that man could not provide for himself. Again, that's how we became children of God, through God sending his son. As a father set a time for his son to come of age, God set the time for his son to come to earth as our redeemer. And so those who were under the law were no better than slaves, but now they become God's sons. And it's interesting how he speaks about this, this time, this fullness of time. Because when Jesus Christ came, guys, it was the right time. The Jews had been groaning for Messiah, and they were under Roman domination. It was the right time culturally, because during that time there was a common language. They had what is called Koine Greek. And so this common language that was spread throughout the Roman world made it easier for the gospel to be presented. You know, English is almost a common language in, in many places. I don't know how many in this room has, uh, have opportunities to travel internationally. But I'm telling you, you go to Europe, and you can go to any, any, any country I've ever been in Europe. I've traveled to a lot of countries. And I can tell you that uh, I don't even speak English that well, let alone a foreign language. And so when I go, I'll just, I'll just walk up to whomever, and I'll speak English. I'll speak English to them. And it's always the same thing. You probably do the same if you're ever in a foreign country. The first thing you do is you say, excuse me, do you speak English? And if, they, if they're in a good mood, they'll say yes. If they're in a bad mood, they'll just look at you. you know? But most of the time, you'll find someone who speaks English. English is a basic language throughout the world. You can, uh, in Japan, you will find people who speak English. In, in, you name the country. In Spain, you find people who speak English. In Israel, it's almost like a second language there. You speak English anywhere. It's a common language. Well, during the time of Christ, Greek was a common language. And so it was right religiously because the Jews, the right time religiously, the Jews were crying out for Messiah and Jesus came. It was right culturally because there was a language that this gospel message could be taken out throughout the world and presented to the world. It was right politically because it was during the time of what is called the Roman peace. And during that time, there were roads that were being built throughout the Roman Empire, which made travel on the roads a lot easier and safer. There was an economic stability. There was political stability. And so it was the right time for Jesus to be born because the Jews were crying out for Messiah, because a language made it possible to speak this message, and the roads and, and the climate made it safer to take and communicate it. And that's what he's speaking about. It was the right time, the fullness of time, the right moment, God's timetable. And what happened, verse 4, he was born of a woman and he was born under the law. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ had complete humanity. He had human nature. This was produced by the power of God in the womb of the Virgin Mary without the intervention of man. According to Matthew 1.20, that which was conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. He was born under the law because those who were in subjection to it would see that the law was fulfilled in him and that through his death the law's power over them would be abolished because Jesus satisfied every requirement of the law perfectly. He's the only one who could ever ask this question. Which of you can convict me of sin? Jesus could have said that and did say that, but he could have said that to anybody. Jesus could look in the face of his mother Mary and he could say, Mom, can you point out one time in my entire life that I sinned? One time. Try that with your mom and when she stops laughing, you'll understand what I'm saying. Say that to your brother or your sister. Can you convict me of sin? Yeah, where do you want to start? <laughs> Say that to your wife if you're married, your husband. Say that to your kids. Can you convict me of sin? Absolutely. Of course. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus Christ is the only person who could ever say, I fulfilled the law perfectly. Not a single thing did I violate. And the law standard is perfection. The man who does these things shall live by them. Meaning that if I'm going to enter into the kingdom of God through obeying, 
then I have to live the perfect life. The problem is, as Jesus pointed out, that the law is spiritual. That's why he said, if I, if I just have a lustful desire in my heart to be with another woman, I have, just as, I have broken the law. If I have anger in my heart in an unjust fashion for somebody, I've broken the law. There's nobody who's ever lived who has, has kept the law 100%. It just doesn't, it, it, it actually is not possible. There's only one who did, and that's Jesus Christ. He was born under the law and fulfilled that law perfectly that we might have a relationship with God. In Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, Paul writes, For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. And so Jesus Christ imputes to us, he gives to us something we don't have. He gives to us, imputes to us his righteousness. We are made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That's what enables you and me to stand before a holy God. Moses, on one occasion, and he was very close to God, God spoke to him in a way that he didn't speak to just anybody. Moses said to God, show me your glory. And God's response was, I can't. No man can look upon my glory and live. But now we have Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, clothed in human flesh, dwelling amongst men, perfectly fulfilling all of the rules, regulations, obligations of the law, doing what you and I can't do, never having a bad thought, never doing a bad thing, living in 100% obedience to the will of the Father, 100%. And then as he fulfills that will, he becomes that sacrificial lamb. He dies on that cross. He's buried and he's resurrected. He imparts to us through our faith in him his own righteousness so that when I stand before God, I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So that when God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of his son. And rather than me trying to earn heaven, I receive it as a gift. The law cannot do that for you. Only Jesus could. Now he says in verses 5 and 6, because you are, rather verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons and become, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So again, I'm not naturally his child. I receive this relationship through adoption and I become a son. And God confirms that I belong to him by giving me his spirit. And he indwells me. Again, we refer to him as Abba, Father. And the spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We belong to him. Therefore, verse 7, you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. A son and an heir. was watching a show recently. I'm trying to remember who this person was. I don't know. They were saying he had, he was, his personal worth was something like 50 some billion dollars. 50 some billion dollars. Does anybody understand the word billion? Because I don't. I, I don't. I don't have a clue what that word means. It's so huge. But this man's personal worth is more than, than, than many countries. He has more money. See, again, you know, it, it sounds like I'm fascinated with money, but I'm actually, like, blown away by it. And I hear this guy's got $50 billion. And, and you know that when you've, when you've got that, that kind of money, none of, us, none of us in this room know what that means. If you do know what that means, talk to me afterwards and share with me. And if you've got that kind of money, will you adopt me? You know? <laughs> Can you imagine what that means? You guys ever wonder where your next dollar is going to come from, ever? 
Do you ever drive by a car lot and look at a nice car and say, man, that is a beautiful car. I would love to have that. Have you ever seen like a, for me, it would be like seeing a, a, a cool hot rod of some sort because I like cars. I like to look at cars. I, you know, man, that is a beautiful 32. Man. Look at what they've got in that. I can't believe it. What a beautiful 55. That's a beautiful 56. That nomad is just so cool. I, I, man, you know, look at that, that, uh, that Mercedes. What a beautiful BMW. I can't believe. And you'll see these cars and you look at them. They're works of art. My, my son David has said, Dad, if you had all this money, would you buy one? The answer is no, I wouldn't. I really wouldn't. You can, well, why wouldn't you, Dad? Well, because um, I don't ever want to drive something that I'm going to want to kill somebody for swinging the door and hitting it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't. I don't want to get mad over a material thing. So, no, why would I want that? I think they're works of art. Some, some cars are whatever, beautiful. I, I saw a show where this guy has his own private plane. He's out there looking for a car. He's going to buy a car. He's bidding on the car, and he stops at $300,000 for this particular car, a car that he's going to drive around for a little while and then put in his garage. $300,000. He's got his private plane flying from up north, down south, doesn't think about it. All the maintenance of the plane, how much it costs to put fuel in. Do you think he thinks about those things? Doesn't think about that at all. Not at all. It's just not something he'd even worry about. Do you think he thinks about, mm, can I afford to go to McDonald's tonight? No. He doesn't think about that either. Does he ever think about any of this? No, for him, money is no object. For these, these guys, you know, these billionaires, you know, what do you want to do today? You know what, I'm so bored. Why don't we go to Paris for it? We'll just go for a few days, and then we'll go down to Madrid. And we can stay there for a few days. And when we're through hanging around in Madrid, let's go up to Barcelona, because Barcelona is so beautiful, and it's the right kind of time of the year. And then from there, let's go to Tokyo, because I really like Tokyo, because there's a, a real cool, you know, right now the cherry blossoms are... You know, they think that way. See, that's something you and I, we just, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Why am I saying all this? I don't really know. I just, I just, because <laughs> I wish I was a billionaire. <laughs> I don't know. Because a lot of times value is really material. Some of these fellows, when they die, some of these ladies, when they die, leave their money to their children. Money that the children did nothing to earn, deserve, they simply receive. God has made me an heir of, of heaven. But heaven to me is such an obscure, it's difficult to envision heaven. C.S. Lewis likened it like this. He said, it's like telling a child the wonders of a beach. Speaking of the wonders of a beach to a child who has never been to the beach and whose form of recreation is opening up a fire hydrant and playing in the water there in the gutter, which a lot of children do even to this day. When it's hot, they open up the fire hydrant, the water pours out, and that's their pool because they'll, they'll never go to a beach. They're not, they don't have the money, they don't have the ability, they play in gutter water. And C.S. Lewis said that that's what people are like. They're, they're content playing in, in, the, in gutter water because they don't have an idea of, of what a beautiful, pristine beach is. What I'm trying to say is most human beings have such a low view of heaven, there's no real longing for it. There's no real imagination of God to be with you and to hear the heavenly choir and to see Jesus and to be in perfection with no tears, no sorrow, no pain, only joy. I, I don't know very many people who actually dwell on that aspect of our faith, you see. But God is saying, I have made you an heir of all that I have. Heaven has gold for paving. It's the streets. The pictures that God gives to us of heaven and the glories are beyond imagination. And so we have become heirs of God through Jesus Christ. We are his children. So we ought not to be so caught up with the here and the now because we can become entangled with the acquisition of things that perish with the using 
and never bring ultimate satisfaction and are always left behind for somebody else to use and abuse. That's why the Lord would say, why don't you lay up your treasures in heaven? Moth doesn't destroy it and rust doesn't corrupt it. It's safeguarded. No thief will break in and steal it. Lay your treasures up in heaven. But we so very often really don't meditate on that. Well, Paul is saying, listen, you become an heir. In Romans 8, 17, if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So we are heirs because he's our father and he's giving to us these things. He says in verse 8, Indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I've labored for you in vain. Before you came to faith in Christ, before you heard that gospel, uh, you were slaves to man-made regulations and salvation by works. So how is it that you are returning to the world's ABCs of righteousness? Because not only are you enslaved by works, but this is an interesting thought, but the religious systems of the world are actually filled with idolatry, and you're going to be taken captive by, by the idolatry of the system. You go into India, the most religious country in the world, and Hinduism, the dominant religious faith there, is, is completely idolatrous. Even forms of Buddhism with that huge statue of Buddha and the offerings and prayers that are made, they're filled with idolatry. And people have a tendency of moving towards the ABCs of the world that is once again based on man-made regulations. So he's asking the question, why do you want to return to bondage? Because those things in the law were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They were only foreshadowing Jesus, those sacrifices and offerings, so that when Jesus died on the cross, he would fulfill those things and you would be able to have a relationship with God through faith in him. Now what is interesting, and I'll close with just one thought in verse 11, is this. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Unless you're a minister like Paul or a pastor teacher, that might just go right past you. But I can tell you I understand somewhat of what Paul is saying. I can tell you that. Because over the years of ministry, I've been ministering for a long time now, I can tell you that there have been times when I've been greatly concerned with the spiritual condition of the fellowship because it seems that sometimes those who profess to know Christ have really never embraced the freedom that truly does come through faith in him. And what happens is people are, no are not free. They actually get turned away and go in directions that take them away from God. I've seen that many times in this fellowship over the years were people who even, one person was even on staff who got turned away and moved off in a direction that was nothing but hurtful for him. And I've seen that. And so Paul's concern here, I'm afraid for you, lest I've labored for you in vain. I'm afraid that you have not really fully embraced and understood the grace of God because if you had, why would you want to substitute the love and grace of God for bondage? Why would you want to do that? Why do you not want to just enjoy Jesus and the freedom that comes through him and the love that comes through him and the mercy that comes through him and the power that comes through him and the joy that comes through him, the peace that comes through him, the mercy that you enjoy in him? Why would you exchange that? I'm worried. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that perhaps I've poured into you something that you have rejected. What a word to say. I'm concerned for you. 
That's the kind of word that over the years when I've read this scripture and read scriptures like it, I've asked the Lord, God, I, 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 I wanna make sure where I stand with you. You haven't labored in vain in my life. I want your spirit to be fully in control of me so that I can walk in a way that pleases you. But I also, to be honest, Lord, I just wanna be in the center of your will and enjoy you. And so I'm asking that I might not find my way entering into bondage, but that I might learn how to walk in freedom. A freedom that comes through Christ that is not a freedom to go back to sin or to continue in sin, but a freedom that comes from being set free from the bondage of sin and religion and gives to me an opportunity to have fellowship with the God who loves me and cares for me as my father, so that I might look at him as being Abba, that I might look at him as being my dad. 